After the French Revolution, an individual you might know named Napoleon came back from his failed expeditions in Egypt and the Middle East and took advantage of the situation to become the first consul after a coup in 1799. From this position of power, Napoleon started his expansionist policy, inspired by conquerors like Julius Caesar and Alexander the Great. He declared himself emperor in 1804 and gradually annexed surrounding nations one by one. However, there was one nation that, with its mighty fleet and isolated position, resisted Napoleon's advances. After spreading some propaganda about his height, the British also established the Third Coalition against France, formed by Austria, Russia, Sweden, Naples, and the British themselves. To accomplish his dream of European unity, Napoleon had to defeat the British in the north to dominate the seas and conquer the rest of Europe with his innovative tactics. And, I must say, Napoleon was a great emperor who accomplished great things. <coughs> But that's another story for another video, so let's keep going. This was Napoleon's plan. France would send a fleet to the Caribbean to distract the British Navy. Meanwhile, an army of 170,000 men stood ready on the French coast, prepared to invade the island. But they couldn't do it alone. Here enters the protagonist of this story, Spain. The Franco-Spanish fleet consisted of 18 French warships and 15 Spanish ones which lacked experience since the French Revolution had eliminated their finest generals. When Villeneuve, the vice admiral of the French fleet, was heading back to Europe, the plant went to nothing as the British got wind of it and defeated their fleet in the Cape of Finisterre. Frustrated and humiliated, Villeneuve disregarded the order to return to Naples and decided to face the English once again, this time in the Bay of Cadiz. The lack of experience became evident once again in the famous Battle of Trafalgar. The Franco-Spanish fleet immediately made their first mistake by forming a U-shaped formation, a vulnerable and difficult to manage position. Vice Admiral Nelson seized the opportunity and headed straight for the center of the line, splitting the fleet into three and sinking or capturing the majority of the ships. This battle gave General Nelson, who died in action, legendary status in British naval history and granted the British absolute power over the seas and oceans of the world. Meanwhile, Spain witnessed its great armada get destroyed right in front of its own coast. You would think that after what happened in Trafalgar, the Spanish and any person with a brain wouldn't trust the French or Napoleon any longer. But Charles IV was not one of them. In October 1807, the Treaty of Fontainebleau was signed between the French and Spanish, which agreed that both of them would join to attack and invade Portugal. With this motive, Charles allowed the French army to enter Spanish territory to invade Portugal while others settled in Spain. Charles IV and his court, happy with their decision, were headed south and found themselves in Aranjuez on March 19, 1808. Out of nowhere, a simple rebellion organized by his own son Ferdinand outstood the king's favorite Godoy and forced the king himself to abdicate. Ferdinand believed that he was now king of Spain, but four days later, Napoleon sent Marshal Murat and an army of 100,000 soldiers to occupy most of the strategic points in Spain. The next month, Napoleon had no problem gathering the obedient Spanish royal family in Bayonne, France. This is exactly what happened on the 20th of April, 1808. Bonjour, come in. Make yourself comfortable, mon ami. Let's see. Let's fix this issue of who should be the king of Spain. I'm sorry, Ferdinand, but we all know that the real and deserved king of Spain is my frère, Josep Bonaparte. After Napoleon's performance in Bayonne, 150 notables were invited, of which 93 went and signed a new constitution, which wasn't bad, but never actually used. Anyways, let's go back to Spain. What the... I just left for a minute. Okay, okay, let's, let's rewind a little bit. As Ferdinand VII departed towards Bayonne, he left behind a governing council, which would be one of his many mistakes. As Infante Don Antonio, who presided over the council, was forced to flee Madrid towards Bayonne, Murat took advantage to disperse his troops throughout Spain. Little did the French anticipate that on May 2nd, 1808, as the last Infantes left the royal palace en route to Bayonne, a popular rebellion would erupt out of nowhere. There's no better way to describe this event than with Goya's paintings on May the 2nd and 3rd, 1808. The bloody mutiny of that day transformed into a popular insurrection for independence that spread throughout Spain during the month of May. Under the pressure of the now armed crowd, several juntas across the country declared war on Napoleon and sent delegates to Great Britain. 
Now, I'm not going to go too deep into the War of Independence and its many battles, but if you show some love to this video in the comments, I will make a part 2 explaining this war in detail. But don't worry, I'll give you a quick summary. The French had an obvious superiority with 110,000 soldiers on Spanish soil, later joined by an additional 50,000. Napoleon believed that it would be just another dynastic war, but it turned out to be a long and bloody conflict. The impact of British aid under the leadership of the Duke of Wellington did contribute to Spanish victory, indeed. However, many historians, especially British ones, fail to do justice to the participation of Spanish and Portuguese in the War of Independence. Local councils emerged that challenged the central authority. In Aranjuez, the Supreme Central Administrative Council was formed, which, despite its limitations, managed to gather the general courts in a single assembly that would change history. By the end of 1810, the war had turned into one of attrition, with the French sending everything they had to Spain. That everything amounted to 400,000 men, who managed to occupy most of the Spanish territory with great difficulty. In the same spot that Spain had been humiliated not that long ago, and where no French soldier had yet reached, the Cortes of Cadiz met up in the Isla de Leon on the 24th of September 1810. There, the courts must have had a time machine or something, because they created La Pepa, a constitution which was very advanced for its times. The constitution of 1812 produced profound changes in Spain. For the first time, there was a more liberal political system, which was more democratic and even recognized human rights. Not only that, but it also granted the freedom of expression, press, and association. The only freedom that really was not granted was that of religion, as the constitution clearly states, the religion of the Spanish nation is, and will be, perpetually the Catholic, Apostolic, and Roman, unique and true. In general, the 384 articles of the Constitution were revolutionary compared to what Spain had before, and it was a massive victory for the liberals. The courts, after three years of work, ended their sessions on the 14th of September 1813. By then, Napoleon was defeated in Russia, and subsequently in Spain when his brother Joseph was defeated in Vitoria by Wellington and expelled from the peninsula. Napoleon, forced by the situation, negotiated an agreement with Ferdinand VII with the Treaty of Valencay on December 1813, which basically gave the throne back to Ferdinand without any conditions. Ferdinand VII, blissfully ignorant to the situation in Europe, was enjoying his vacation in France. He came back to Spain on the 22nd of March, 1814, cheered and celebrated by the masses. But before we start talking about his wonderful reign, let's check some sources to see what they had to say about him as a person. His first wife, Maria Antonia of Naples, described him as dumb, idle, a liar, and not even a man physically. Others that met him described him as barely cultured, a coward and not able to have a minimum plan of government. His first great contribution as king was to go to Valencia, where the absolutists gave him the Manifest of the Persians. This was a publication signed by 67 diplomats that criticized everything that had happened in Spain since 1808 and suggested the removal of the Cortes of Cadiz and the installment of an absolute monarchy. Here commenced the Great March Backwards where everything that had been considered radical was removed and the ways of the old regime were rebuilt. All the progress made in the Cortes of Cadiz were eliminated, and Ferdinand even tried bringing back class society. The restoration of absolute monarchy didn't bring Spain back to its golden days, completely the opposite. In the years of Ferdinand VII, Spain was reduced to a second-order nation. Let's see how this happened. The first years of Spain after the war were tough. There was a huge debt which obligated Spain to spend on foreign loans, massive administrative disorganization, and a lot of corruption. But the cherry on top was that its king didn't even have a clear plan or clear strategy on how to fix it. The perfect example of the disastrous administration of Ferdinand VII was when he secretly decided to join the Holy Alliance, joining forces with one of the most reactionary nations of the time, Tsarist Russia. He decided to make an agreement with Russia, he had managed to get paid by the British due to the end of the slave trade, and decided to spend it on a bunch of boats. And these boats were completely useless. He could have tried to reconquer America, 
or a serious military strategy or, or something. No, 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 no. He did absolutely nothing with them. Oh my God. And don't get me started on America. Well, if you... Okay, let's get back to the video. It doesn't surprise anyone when, in the next couple of years, conspiracies started against the absolute monarchy. This was done mostly by angry urban citizens. These rebellions occurred in 1814 in Pamplona, in 1815 in A Coruña, in 1816 when they tried to kidnap Ferdinand, in 1817 in Barcelona, in 1818 in Andalusia, and in 1819 in Valencia. But it wasn't until a liberal general named Riego led a military takeover in the province of Sevilla. His main objective was to restore the 1812 constitution, a message that resonated with many other provinces and finally forced Ferdinand to accept the restoration of La Pepa. This new era in Spain is known nowadays as the Three Liberal Years. The army of Cadiz and a national militia formed by armed citizens acted as the guarantee for the liberal revolution and the constitution of 1812. During this short period of liberalism, many freedoms were granted to society and many efforts were done to modernize the public administration, as, for example, for the first time ever, Spain was divided into provinces. But, as I said before, it was a short period that only lasted three years. It all ended when Ferdinand asked help from the Holy Alliance to get his power back. Seeing this coming, the liberal governments formed three armies to fight the invaders, which didn't have much popular support as the people were tired of war. Finding little to no resistance, the Holy Alliance, led by France, helped to restore the power back to Ferdinand. While the French were being expelled from Spain and debates about liberalism versus absolute monarchy were taking place, the lack of unity and central authority in the peninsula sparked independence movements across Spanish America. Furthermore, the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805 destroyed connections between the two hemispheres as the Atlantic came under British control. By 1814, Peru had become the main stronghold of Spanish resistance, leading to temporary restorations and reconquest of certain regions. However, the deep crisis in Spain during the early absolutist years of Ferdinand VII resulted in the independence of Chile in 1817 and the creation of Gran Colombia in 1819. By the time the three liberal years began, Spain only held onto the colonies of Mexico, Peru, parts of Colombia, Cuba, and other territories. During this era of radical measures, conservative societies in Mexico panicked and initially considered welcoming Ferdinand VII. However, they made the right decision to pursue independence, which was achieved in 1821. The former colony of New Granada also gained its liberation in the same year. Peru, once again, became the bastion of Spanish resistance in the Americas but it was ultimately lost in 1825, along with Bolivia in 1826. All these losses further worsened the economic problems during Ferdinand VII's reign. American trade plummeted by 90%, and Spanish trade decreased to a mere quarter of its former volume. Upon his return, Ferdinand VII implemented a series of measures to consolidate his authority and restore absolutism in Spain. He also found and repressed those who supported liberal ideas. The Portuguese succession of 1826 created the liberal situation in Portugal, which generated concerns in Spain and led to a rift between the brothers Ferdinand and Charles. The following year, a popular anti-liberal uprising erupted in Catalonia against Ferdinand VII's leniency towards liberals. This popular revolt in Catalonia, known as the Agraviados or Malcontents, served as a precursor to the future Carlism movement. The death of Ferdinand's third wife, Maria Josefa of Saxony, raised the possibility of succession for his brother Charles, a staunch reactionary and an absolute monarchist. Concerned about his own health and advanced age, Ferdinand hastily decided to marry his niece to ensure that he had offspring who could succeed him. Shortly after, in March 1830, Ferdinand VII enacted the Pragmatic Sanction, which restored the law of succession, allowing a woman to inherit the throne. In October 1830, Ferdinand VII's daughter, Isabel II, was born and became the heir to the throne. This created a conflict with the ultra-absolutist powers, known as the Carlists, who considered that the promulgation of the pragmatic sanction had been illegal and believed that Ferdinand VII had violated the existing legislation. Ferdinand passed away on September 29, 1833, but not without leaving behind an unstable situation that triggered a civil war over the succession to the throne, marking the beginning of the Carlist Wars.
If you made it this far, what are your thoughts on the reign of Ferdinand VII? Let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching.